This is KGW News at Noon. A celebration today in downtown Portland over burgers and fries and a milkshake to wash them down. Shake Shack opened its first Portland location today, right across from Powell's Bookstore on West Burnside. Thanks for joining us here at noon. I'm Drew Carney. After today's ribbon cutting, a long line of customers filed in to get their burgers, fries, and shakes. And the first 100 customers also got a custom hat made by Portland Gear. We know businesses have left Portland in recent years, some in the last few weeks, but that didn't stop Shake Shack from moving in. This has been several years in the making. We actually uh, started this project uh, back in 2018, uh, and we just love this location. Powell's Books is such an institution. You got Sizzle Pizza across the street, uh, the West End right here. Uh, so we're just thrilled to be here. We got a great patio, and uh, we just wanted to build a great community gathering place for the city of Portland. My boys are on the East Coast, and they let me know, you're getting a Shake Shack, and I'm like, I'm getting one? Like, I get my own Shake Shack? And he goes, no, 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 they're opening one in downtown. So I said, okay, I'll go try it out. I mean, it's cool, this fact that we have something new in town, and uh, it's nice to add things, like, in this area specifically, especially in front of Powell's, so everyone wants to come here, so that's nice. You get a Shake Shack, and you get a Shake Shack. Everybody gets a Shake Shack. Uh, this is actually the second Shake Shack location in the metro area. There's also one in Beaverton in the Cedar Hills area. Jury selection, meanwhile, got underway today in the trial against Pacific Corps over the power company's alleged role in Oregon's historic wildfires in September of 2020. 17 Oregon residents are part of a $1.6 billion class action lawsuit. They allege Pacific Corps failed to shut off power equipment before and during the Labor Day windstorm that helped spark and contribute to the spread of several major fires that year. The fires burned more than one million acres, destroyed thousands of homes, and killed nine people. State and federal investigators still have not ruled on the cause of those fires. All right, we're going to jump into the Weather Center now, but first a live look at downtown Portland Rod Hill. That is a beautiful picture, perhaps a, uh, a sign of things to come as this week rolls on. What do you have for us this afternoon? Well, so the, the radar, if you just look at the radar and let's say Drew did not show you that sunshine over the road, so you go, wow, it's kind of gray outside. We've got scattered showers popping all over the place. In fact, we have a shower that just passed south of downtown. But when you combine the two, you come up with the realization that Yes, there are showers, but they're brief and they're quick hitting and they're quickly replaced with a partly cloudy sky. So overall, as you're out and about this afternoon, it's going to be pretty decent. We have sunshine over Cannon Beach. The tide's out a little bit. You can walk up to the Haystack Rock. It's 50 degrees, very bright. You can see the cumulus clouds, though. This is up in Woodland along the Lewis River at Lewis River Golf Course. And there's the scene that uh, Drew just showed you over the city. 54 degrees is the temperature outside. The scattered shower chance for mostly brief hitting showers will be with us into early this evening. I think we'll hit 60 today and then by 8 o'clock the sun's starting to go down and set and I think the rain chance will totally end and that will kick off five days of completely dry weather. We'll talk about that big warm up still expected in my seven day forecast. Yeah, we had that coming up Rod in about 12 minutes, but now back to some of our local headlines this afternoon. Two people died and two others were hurt in four separate Portland area shootings over the weekend. The gun violence stretched from the east side of the city out to Hillsboro, where a 17 year old boy was shot at the Washington County Fairgrounds Sports Complex. KGW's Blair Best has more on the police investigations into all four crimes. Images of a crime scene have become all too common here in the Rose City, and this weekend was no exception, with two people dying in shootings, marking 25 homicides in Portland this year. The first happened early Saturday morning around 2. Police responded to a shooting inside an affordable housing complex in the Cully neighborhood in northeast Portland. When they got there, they found a man dead. His identity has not been released since it's early in the investigation and no one has been arrested. Around 10.30 Sunday morning, another deadly shooting, this time inside a business on Southeast Foster Road. When police got there, they found one person dead. There are very few details about this case, and police continue to investigate.
In Hillsboro, a 17-year-old boy was shot at the Washington County Fairgrounds Sports Complex Saturday around 5 p.m. He was taken to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Two people are now in custody. They're 17 and 15 years old. Police are still investigating what led up to the shooting, but say there is no threat to the public. And Washington County deputies are looking for this man who is accused of attempting to kill a woman. 43-year-old Glenn Hornsby Jr. tried to rob a woman, fired a gun at her, and then when she tried to drive off, he chased her and shot at her again. Now this was Friday evening on Northwest Dogwood Street in the Cedar Mill area. The woman was hit once in the chest. She was taken to the hospital, treated and released. Deputies say they found Hornsby's car in Hillsboro and consider him him to be armed and dangerous. Now anyone with information on any of these cases is asked to contact their local police department. Meanwhile, Portland Police's focused intervention team continues to remove illegal guns from the streets. They captured this one Saturday evening from a reckless driver around Southeast 92nd in Division. That driver was taken to jail. As for the gun, police are checking to see if it's connected to any shootings. Blair Best, KGW News. Also over the weekend, dozens of people gathered to pay tribute to the radio cab driver who authorities say was murdered by a passenger inside his cab earlier this month. 43-year-old Reese Lawhon drove a taxi for a radio cab for more than a decade. To honor him, fellow drivers organized a memorial drive through Portland on Saturday. There's a lot of anger, a lot of just not able to understand why this happened. Um, and there's no putting the pieces together to figure this one out. Uh, there just isn't. Court documents say Lahan picked up murder suspect Moses Lopez on April 8th. Police say Lopez stabbed Lahan from the back seat of his cab. Lopez was arrested and has since pleaded not guilty to second degree murder. What I told the folks is either a gross misdemeanor or a misdemeanor I would sign because we need a bill. We cannot accept decriminalization in the middle of a fentanyl crisis of these drugs. That is Washington Governor Jay Inslee speaking about the drug possession bill that failed to pass in Olympia. Unless lawmakers in Washington find another way to address the issue, drug possession will be legalized statewide come July 1st. Farah Jadron from our sister station in Seattle explains what will happen next. When the current law expires, local governments will have the ability to regulate drug possession at the local level. The current state law classifies drug possession as a misdemeanor, but only on the third offense. Take a look at your screen. We've outlined it for you. The current law comes with lighter penalties on the left of your screen. Then you take a look here on the right. This is what was proposed last night in a negotiated version of Senate Bill 5536 to raise penalties to a gross misdemeanor carrying a harsher maximum jail sentence of about a year, up to $5,000 and fines or both. Lawmakers agree something has to be done about the state's addiction crisis, but not yet finding a way to fully combat it. Everything that comes with substance use disorder, defecation on the streets, needles in our parks, all of the things we've heard about that we fear will be worse if this bill fails. Many of those suffering from addiction, they don't feel like they're worthy enough for recovery. And this bill doesn't help with that, in my opinion. The negotiated Senate bill would have encouraged judges to advance a defendant's recovery and allow somebody convicted of drug possession to vacate their conviction by completing a designated substance use disorder treatment program. Now, what can happen next is that the governor is urging leaders of the chambers to find enough votes to pass a bill by July 1st. He could also call lawmakers into a special session to do that.